Well, look at verse 10 and verse 11. I just want to unpack a few truths from this. Beware of materialism clouding your minds with the idolatry of coveting. We are supposed to keep alert to any blinding that, that is happening, this clouding of our minds that idolatry brings. And so what he says in verse 10, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens will pass away, the elements will melt, both the earth and, and all the works will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, look at the choices we're to pursue. What Peter does, that all that run up in verses 10, all the way through most of verse 11, is just, is just giving you a location, a, 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 an arena that we're to live in. He said, this is how you're supposed to live. Look at the end, what we're to pursue in life at the end of verse 11. It's a pair of words that he uses. He says, in holy conduct and godliness. No, what what now, Peter said is that we should live in holiness, in, in this godliness and this holy conduct. Now, in Greek, if you looked at that simply, you'd see they're both plural. So basically, the two words at the end of verse 11 are not translatable in English because we don't say in all manner of holy conducts and godlinesses. That doesn't make sense to us. Godliness, but not godlinesses. And holy conduct, not holy conducts. But you know what in Greek, why you put the plural on? When you do a pair of words that are normally singular, that are, that are describing actions and attitudes, and you put them in the plural form, it's their way of saying spread it all around. Kind of like, did you ever put on a suntan lotion and your mom says, now, don't leave blotches. You know, it'll be red marks. You know, spread it around. You know what the Lord says? Don't leave any uncovered areas of your life. Look at the end of verse 11. Spread holy conduct and godliness over every part. The sense is that holy conduct is the action. That's how I live my life. Godliness is the attitude. It's the, the central way of reverence in my life. And both holy conduct and godly reverence should cover everything I do. He says, if you know that everything's going to be destroyed, you reverence the one that told you that, and you pursue what is holy conduct in his sight. And that's basically what Peter said. Holy conduct is to rule my behavior. Godliness is to rule my heart. And that means as it overflows, it spreads to cover everything in my life. You say, okay, what does that mean? Well, what it means is we all are designed to crave something. Now look at, at 1 Peter chapter 1. Remember, this is an integrated book. Peter wrote both of them. He's communicating with the same crowd, and, and he knows that they have already had his first book read over and over again in the congregation. And so we need to kind of get up to speed with what they knew so we understand what he's saying in his last words. And look at chapter 1, verse 13. We are all designed to crave. And Peter already reminded them of that in their first letter. He says, you were born with a hardwired desire for things. In fact, later, the Apostle John in 1 John 2 calls it the lust of the eyes and the flesh. We long for things, we crave them like the Israelites craved in the wilderness. We crave for things that displeases the God who asks us to crave him. Did you catch that? We crave for things to the displeasure of the God who asks us to crave him. So look at, look at verse 13. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Wait a minute. Any of you that were here back when we were in Titus, that's the only characteristic that is for every godly man, godly woman, older and younger in the church. All four groups in the curriculum of Titus 2 are told to be sober. That idea is to not let anything get us under its control. So what he's saying is, it, the spiritual realm is in your mind. Gird up the loins of your mind. All spiritual life and, and all desires and cravings start in the mind and he says, be sober. Don't let anything get the control on you and rest your hope fully on the grace that's to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He says, he says, you can overcome this way that you were hardwired. Verse 14, as obedient children, don't conform yourselves to the former lusts. We were born possessive. We were born self-centered. We were born covetous to the point of idolatry in our greed for me and my. In fact, another passage we're going to look at in the future is the rich fool. This night, you know, your life will be required of you. And, and he was saying, eat, drink, and be merry. Did you know it's the most 
self-centered parable Christ ever told. It's all I and me and my and I will build in my house and my treasures. And what Jesus was showing is that that's how, apart from his grace, we are wired. So he says, don't, look at verse 14. Don't conform yourselves to those materialistic lusts in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, be holy in all your conduct. Spread that holy conduct and godliness over all parts of your life. Just, that's why it's in the plural in chapter three. Just spread it all over. And he says, verse 16, why should we do this? Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. And if you call in the Father who without partiality judges, wait a minute, Father judges, what are those two words doing together? There is no condemnation to those in Christ. What is the Father judging us for? The judgment seat of Christ. It's what you have in your basket. That's the judgment he's talking about. We are going to be judged. We're going to be judged over whether what we did is going to cause us to suffer loss, 1 Corinthians 3, 13 to 15, or we're going to get eternal gain from it. So what he's saying is, look at this. If you call on the Father who without partiality is going to judge what's in your cart and basket according to your work. Conduct yourselves through the time of your stay here in fear. What are we fearing? We don't want to displease him. He's already told us what not to put in the cart. So every time we, we reject, ignore, or neglect what he's told us he doesn't want in our cart, it displeases him. And so we live our time here in reverential awe. We don't want to displease him. What, what Peter is saying is that we need to crave God and not things. He, he had this reverential awe in life. He said, God, whether therefore I eat or drink, whatever I do, I want to do it to your glory. As Paul put it, he said, I want to crave you. Well, basically, we are not to deny the urge for living just to satisfy uh, the, the, the ways of the world that's causing us to float along. Rather, we're to say, I am not here living to eat. I'm not here living to work. I work in order to live after my master's desires and commands.